Welcome, everyone. I'm Mike Brashazade. And I'm Ashley Ward. And you're listening to the What Matters Podcast and our mission to spotlight top RIAs, wealth managers, and investment professionals who are redefining wealth management. Join us as we dive into their journey, strategies, and insights. Whether you're an investor or an inspiring pro, this is for you. Get ready for impactful conversations on the What Matters Podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the What Matters Podcast. I'm Mike Day, And I'm Ashley Ward. And today we're thrilled to have a distinguished guest, Larry Boggs, the founder and president of Boggs and Company Wealth Management out of Western Maryland. Welcome, Larry. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Good to be here. It's fantastic to have you join us today here, Larry. Thanks so much. Um, let's hop right back, hop right into your uh, story and your journey. So you've had an extensive career spanning over 50 years in the financial advisory field. That's very, very impressive. Could you share with our listeners your journey in the industry and the pivotal experiences that led you to founding Boggs and Company Wealth Management in 2021, I believe? Sure. Um, So before we got on the air, Mike and I were talking a little bit about how I got interested and got involved in the market. And I grew up, my dad was a golf pro, and I had a very much misspent youth my whole time being on a golf course. But at an early age of 10, 11, I met a guy by the name of Joe Dajane, who was a partner with Butcher and Sherrod at the time. Got me interested in the market. All the money I made as a kid, I sent to Joe. We invested it. Uh, Joe was a pretty good stock picker and made a bunch of money as a kid. And I went to University of Maryland on a golf scholarship. And Joe said to me, Larry, when you graduate from Maryland, you will work for me. So the rest is kind of history. I went to Maryland, played four years, come out of college. And at 21, I went to work for Joe. Uh, I spent time in Philly and Pittsburgh, but eventually uh, moved back to Hagerstown, Maryland, which is about an hour away from where where I am located here. Um, I worked for 48 years with eight or nine different companies and never changed companies. One company got acquired by another company, got acquired by another company, Butcher and Sherrod, Butcher and Singer, Wheat First, Wheat First, Butcher Singer, uh, First Union, Wachovia, Wells, and I probably skipped a couple or two along the way there. Um, And then two years ago, actually almost three years ago now, we spun off and set up our own independent company with LPL. Um, I have great memories of working with those predecessor firms, but it's more of the people and not the companies. The relationships that I made with other advisors, with traders, with management was spectacular. But by the time I got to the end with Wells and all the problems they were having, um, I got to the stage where I I had to make a change. I mean, I just could not survive. at, at my age, I could have stayed there. I could have retired there. And uh, I had too many ideas and too many things to do. So uh, we spun off. And uh, I, I guess probably the biggest regret that I have doing that is I didn't do it a decade before. Um, the, the change was so severe and so wonderful that uh, I, I should have done it before. Period. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I was going to say to you there is 48 years and you know, that with the company being acquired and reacquired and, and whatnot, um, you know, obviously when it got to the point where it probably hit Wachovia and then hit Wells, it, it, it got to that uh, level where you guys were having meetings about what the next meeting was going to be about, right? Um, yeah, it, 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 and this is terrible to say, but there was so much compliance problems yeah. at the bank side, more so than the advisory side, that, uh, you know, you were fighting headline news with your clients all the time. It, you know, it became not fun. Wow. So, so let me ask you this. Uh, so uh, just a couple of years ago, you guys had decided to, you know, spun off on, on, uh, on your own there. Um, how did that, how did that come about? Right. So y- you've been at, the, you've been working underneath, uh, you know, these larger umbrellas and companies for, you know, close to, ha- you know, half a century, right. A couple of years ago, you guys are like, let's just go do this. Or you're, li- you're like, let's go do this on our own. And, and I'm asking you that for the for saying that you guys have built quite a substantial, uh, substan- substantially large AUM in just that short amount of time. How did that transition come about? So, um, I shouldn't say this, but I will. I don't do anything fast. 
okay? I dated my wife 10 years before we got married, okay? I don't rush into things. I took a couple years, literally, and we talked to, we being one or two of my daughters and I, and I should say three of my daughters are on my team, um, probably 20 companies. And did a light dive on those 20 and then did a deep dive on three. And I think at the end of the day, we could have ended up with any of the three and we would have been far better off than where we were at Wells. And we finally landed with LPL. Um, not a commercial, but just a fact. They have um, provided us, and did everything they said they were going to do for us once we joined them. It wasn't like there was a light of idle promises and they were going to do this and they were going to do that and they didn't do it. Uh, they have, for us, done everything plus a bunch more. And I'll be honest, I have recruited a handful of teams already for them, uh, just sharing my experiences with them. Wow. And and so LPL, um, do you guys uh, you kind of run your your company underneath them? How does that operate? Well, they basically do all the clearing for us. They provide all the services. We can use as little or as much of what they want to provide as possible. So let's talk just specifically. Um, two of my daughters, uh, Marjana and Kusi, uh, have a weekly marketing meeting with them. Okay. I never had any direct marketing with Wells Fargo ever. We do our own newsletter. We we, we do blast emails. Uh, they're providing that conduit for us, if you wish, or that, that mechanism. Um, we have a coach that works with us constantly on running the practice. We have our own CFO internal, which is Guzzi, but we have one with LPL that and what's changed my life is that Larry personally, I'm not involved day to day so much in running the company anymore. Whereas I used to be. Now Kusi's running the majority of it and I'm spending ninety five, ninety seven percent of my time with clients is what I'm good at and what I really like to do. And I tell everybody I've had more fun the last year working than I have forever. I mean, it, it's just because you're, you're doing what you want to do. And I am extremely blessed. We have a large practice, but I have families that I'm on the third, in some cases, the fourth generation that we've taken care of. So, you know, our, our kind of theme, if you wish, of the team is our family taking care of yours. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't share something else. 80% of my team is females. They're women. Okay. Extremely unusual in our world. Mm -hmm. And besides having three daughters, I've promoted the women on my team and I have four licensed female assistants. Okay. Um, I have four non-licensed female assistants. I have three virtual assistants. Okay. All women. Um, it didn't start out that way. It wasn't scheduled that way, but it's where we are and it's worked. Wow. And, and so it, it, if you don't mind me asking, how many total advisors do you guys have at this point? Four. Gotcha. Um, I met with two teams yesterday in DC and without saying things I can't, I have a handshake on almost as big a team as we have that, uh, I think we're going to start merging shortly after the first of the year. Um, yeah, LPL is put into place for us. Um, and Kusi has built the infrastructure so that we can do a plug-in for an individual or a group of advisors pretty easily. <laughs> Excuse me. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, so building that gen multi generational firm, you know, with a strong emphasis on family values, I love that. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the importance of that multi generational planning and how you've integrated that within the leadership structure of Box and Company? I mean, you have Kusi, and then I believe your your two other daughters are also working with you there, right? So, 
Yeah, so let's do it both sides. Um, I got to tell you, having all the girls work on the team is challenging at times. Okay, there's family dynamic, but it's challenging at times. But I got to tell you, clients really love seeing the multi generations. Okay, so my oldest daughter is kind of our PR front person kind of a title that I've given her, the person on the team who's in charge of providing unusual happiness to clients. And she's out there doing special stuff all the time. Marjana is my front person in the, in the community. Marjana is one of the trustees at the local college. She's chairman of the community foundation. She's on the hospital board. She's the largest corporate fundraiser for the hospital in the area. So she's been involved and that was kind of what my wife and I did a long time ago when we came to the community. Um, we broke up the community and I got on one hospital board and she got on the other. We turned around and she was on one board and one organization and I was on the other. And what it did at very young ages, and I'm talking about in our 20s, put us around board members that were in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and oh, by the way, fairly wealthy people, it created a, a stabilizing and equalizing, I guess is the word I'm looking for, to get involved with those people. Now, when I take the same thing and I take it over to my clients, estate planning, trust services are an extremely important part of our practice. And to the extent that I have a situation with a trust attorney, that at least one day a month, he is in my office all day meeting with my clients. So early on, I'm tying in, if you want to call it the grandparents to the parents to the grandkids. And in many cases, we turn around and maybe the grandparents are the trustees of the trust. Ultimately, we'll use a corporate trustee on the next or the third generation. And what that does is that perpetually ties the family to my family. And clients, again, like that perpetual, something happens to us, we know that the kids or the grandkids are going to be taken care of. Yeah. And I've always been involved in estate planning, and I've been blessed to get involved with some really big people early on where you did that and now I've tied it into a lot of the middle of my practice you know that two million three million five million dollar type of account that that needs it but again we're trying to perpetuate the service that makes sense at all yeah <laughs> so uh that leads me into my question there and you guys have built about as you is you know not that RIA database is correct, but when we do our research prior to getting on the podcast, around a billion dollars of AUM so far? That is correct. Um, i tell you what, let me be more specific with you. We had about a billion three at Wells when we left. When we looked at what we were inviting the people to come to us, about a hundred million we chose not to bring, including my largest account customer. <laughs> And I had a scenario with a family that I'd taken care of over 40 years. Uh, Grandma was my key person in the relationship. She dies. Granddaddy takes over. And Granddaddy doesn't want to pay for anything. Everything's free. And when I started looking at the economics of trying to deal with this $40 million relationship, and we don't want to pay for anything, I don't need it. I mean, it's like I'm my own company now. We're you know, I, I want to be fair, I want to be competitive, but, and we chose not to bring them along. And there was probably a, a hundred million accounts like that. We decided not. Now, in fairness, there was a hundred million dollars that we wanted to come that for whatever reason didn't. And I got to tell you, some of that was trust institutional stuff that was at Wells Bank. And a number of them were nonprofits, and the 
powers to be in the nonprofit changed. So my relationship with the nonprofit was probably not as strong as maybe five or ten years before. Um, we saw last year's market where it, uh, you know, we gave back because of market decline. Uh, we've been really blessed with new money coming in, and we're, I'm going to say to you right now, probably a million one, maybe a tad over that. And that's a little hard to judge because we do have, I don't know, 30 or so, maybe 40 uh, 401ks that are off the books. So I don't necessarily know an exact number on that. But uh, if you want for documentation, we're caught a billion to a billion one. Wow. So, and and did all that um, business come, uh, the growth come organically or um, you, you mentioned that there's going to be some inorganic growth on the horizon there? Everything up to this stage, we we have developed. Uh, I, oh, I think I was going to say what well, my question there is. So, I really love the inorganic growth uh, side that you're looking at now in regards to building your firm and taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, now, in, if you guys are going to plug in another firm into your firm, um, does that does that concern you from a cultural perspective, or uh, how do you how do you uh, think that's going to be working out for you guys? Mike, I, th I think it will be fine. We've been doing, let's say, we've been doing a lot of courting with these people, getting to know them, getting to understand their practice, getting to understand how they take care of their clients. Um, and let me be extremely frank on something. Larry, at this stage, I need to bring the next generation into my team. Okay, I need. I started in the business when I was 21. Okay, 50 years this year. So put it together, you know how old I am. And I plan on working a long time, but I also know that going forward, I need the next generation of 30, 40, and 50 year olds to carry on what I've built here. Uh, my two daughters or three daughters, they can do part of it. They, they can't do it all. So from my standpoint, it's critical for Boggs and Company to perpetuate itself is to have that next generation of advisors in place. Um, Mike, you raise a great point, though, about the culture, will it fit? Um, we are about 70% fee-based, about 30% non-fee-based. Um, most of the teams that I'm talking to are almost 90% or more fee-based. So I don't think it's going to be a real problem. Um, I'm working on, personally, on a couple large things in the D.C. area that, assuming they happen, and I think they will, I'm going to need to physically have a presence down there more than I did. Years ago, I had a uh, an office in a Wells office on Wisconsin Avenue. Uh, well, actually, I tell you, when Kusi was in college, how long it's been, and uh, she was a licensed broker when she was in college, and um, it was a great place for us to work, but it wasn't worth me spending all the money eventually. Um, she went on to uh, working, you know, well, she ended up going to work for Barclays, so she went next. But, uh, I, I think I'm worried about the culture, but I'm comfortable with the culture. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, 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 I like that. Yeah. Um, I, I want to kind of go back to the whole core principle of your business. I, I mean, for, of empowering women. I feel like that it's very rare to hear that in this industry. Um, you noted that you, you know, over 80% of your practice is female. How has that unique composition, you know, influenced your approach to financial advising and the dynamics within your firm? Um, so let me answer it slightly differently. So if you were coming into me as a client and you had the luxury or we had the luxury of having you in our office, and maybe it's a Zoom meeting, but pretend you're my office. That meeting would not be just with me. 
that meeting is going to be with Larry, one person, two people more. And depending upon your interest, depending upon what we want to talk about, I have different ladies on my team that have different expertise. Molly on my team, MBA, been with me 12, 13 years, heads up all of our managed money operations. She will turn around and you're coming into me. I know you're coming in. I know you have a half a million dollars in cash. Okay. You got a million dollars in cash. You got whatever. Molly will start out and we will build a model portfolio using money managers. Maybe you're coming in with um, an insurance problem. You have an existing policy. You have uh, a joint life policy. You have something. Brenda on my team, who is my insurance expert, guess who's going to be in that? If indeed you're coming in looking for income, maybe Michelle on my team, who does all of our structured notes and investments, she would be part of that conversation. So I have actually given, let's call it authority, power to these women, and I expect them to come in and present to you as my client whatever area of expertise they have. I'm not going to try to throw them under a bus or getting to talk about things that they're not comfortable with or I am not sure that they're not knowledgeable about, but has it's become a nice partnership. So I have two young ladies, 27, 26, and almost 30. One just got her license. One's working on her license. One of those always sit with me in a meeting. They take the notes. They do the notes after the meeting. If there's paper that needs to be done, if there's docu signs that need to be done, now that client, and now that prospect, that person not only knows Larry, who do they know? Right. Michelle. Rochelle. They, they, they know Emily. So that what I'm trying to do is, just like I said to you, I'm not spending a lot of time running the company as much as doing clients, I want to do the client, I want to provide the service, but then I need somebody else to kind of take care of all the loose ends, if that makes any sense. And they do that for me. So what that really does, it frees up Larry, that I can go on to the next conversation, the next client. And a typical day for me in my office would be a couple meetings in the morning, a couple meetings in the afternoon, maybe two Zooms here, whatever. Um, so my day is pretty much schedule it, it, it's it, it, it's a treadmill and i love it i mean i i, I have again i say i'm having fun with it and, um i'm watching my ladies all mature i'm watching them get better and better all the time now um of my four licensed assistants i have one that has hinted slightly about being an advisor um in a perfect world for me I would turn a couple of those into advisors. But I'm not I'm not there yet. And I'm not sure they're there confidence wise to do that yet. Does that help? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And um how how do you think this focus of women, you know, has contributed to the success and the distinctive positioning of Box and Company? I mean, as you know, it sounds like it really has helped it become the success that it is today. It, it what, actually, what, it has truly helped in, in many ways. Um, let me separate it a little bit. With the daughters involved, the da the clients love the multi generation, the next generation mm -hmm. coming. They see my expectation of the daughters not only in my office but in the community out representing us and doing all kinds of things. Okay, Kusi. Extremely good athlete. In high school, she was a, a Heisman High School winner. Wow. I don't know if you know what that is or not, but that is each state has a best female and male athlete. She was the best female athlete in the District of Columbia. Wow. Okay. wow. Now, carrying forward. What 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 sport did she play? Soccer. Okay. 
Oh, wow. Now, did not mention it. I have a special needs grandson. Trey was born genetically very bad. Six fingers on each hand, three kidneys, an extra part to his heart, overgrowth, life expectancy was not very good. Trey is now 19, looks like a linebacker, goes about two and a quarter, um, still autistic, um, off the chart smart, extremely immature. That has changed my family dynamics to the extent that I do a lot of work around autism. My wife has been involved. And oh, by the way, Kusi coaches three special needs teams. Wow. In our okay. So she's given it back in soccer, in basketball, and in track. Okay. Wow. Kusi coaches a, an adult male basketball. Wow. Wow. Okay. So the family dynamic has kind of went across the board. Now, I think I mentioned earlier that when my kids were young, I gave them an opportunity to come to work for me. We have a situation coming up this summer where Shauna's oldest son, Liam, is going to be in the ninth grade. My philosophy about kids is in the ninth grade, you need a job. I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you be, be a lifeguard, you be a babysitter, you work McDonald's, you work retail. I don't care what you work, but you need to work some. I didn't say you have to work 40 hours a week, but you need to be responsible. Right. You need to learn to be around people. You learn to have communicators. Right. Liam will be my intern next summer. I really like that. Well, he says, Pap, do I have to wear a tie and a suit? I said, well, young man, you're going to wear at least a tie. Okay, You're not going to come to me in a t-shirt or a golf shirt. So if you're going to work, you're going to look the part. And um, right or wrong, old school, I expect my whole team to dress professionally in business class. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Kuzi is trying to break me of that to the extent of missing, having an occasional, occasional casual Friday, but I'm pretty much old school. <laughs> no, okay. I grew up oh, to working with my dad, who was a golf pro. Old school golf pros did what? Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Okay. My whole life, I saw my dad in a necktie. Um, I was with my dad hunting and fishing in a necktie. I've been my five percent, so <laughs> wow, that's what I got. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you, oh, I was going to oh, say, um, say that that's going to be very fun next summer. I'm right sure there, I think everybody just having your grandson me. there with you. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and he will learn just like yep. my daughters. Learn, you know. You you around it and um, developing people skills is so critical no matter what we end up doing in life. Yeah. And you can see some really brilliant people that have no people skills. Mm -hmm. And you can see people that have good people skills that can be very successful doing whatever because of their ability to interact with people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that. You know, um, I, I wish that, uh, you know, my father, grandfather, you know, had a business like yours. My, my father had gas stations and, you know, he made my twin brother and I, we had to start going to work with him on any free moment that we had at the age of eight on up. Right. Um, so by the time that we were 14, even though the legal driving, you know, age was 16, he, we already had a car and we had to drive 52 miles to and from his gas stations and he had like shifts for us where he was, where there, he didn't hire other people, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, I like it. you know, I, I enjoy, I, 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 I like when, you know, you know, I think it's important for, you know, individuals at that, that, at that age to start a work ethic. And I mean, it seems like they got great mentors as well. So that's fantastic. Well, it's, it, it's been good. And again, I'm going to say to you, clients kind of respect seeing the kids 
they respect seeing the kids volunteering. Um, we do, as a company, as a family, we do substantial charity work, and I think we are obligated. This community has been extremely kind to us and generous to us, and both in time but in money, it's important to pay it back. Mm -hmm. Okay, and at an early age, I've tried to, um, I don't want to say sell that concept to my kids, but teach them how important it is to give back. Right. And, yeah. and I've tried to get, and it's not quite the same when you don't have, they're not family, but they're employees, trying to get my team to volunteer doing other things. Okay. I mentioned Molly's name. So in the last few years, Molly got on the Chamber of Commerce, okay, which I did a hundred years ago, and Marjana did. Guess what? Now she's an officer. Next year, she'll probably be president. You know, but it gets her in the face of the community again as a woman, but also as a woman part of Larry's team. Mm -hmm. the more that we can do, it just makes your presence in the community. You stand out from everybody else. So speaking of the community and, you know, where you guys are going with your, you know, uh, uh, the growth of, of your RIA, your firm there, what do you, where do you see things five years from now in regards to growth and uh, where you're going to be and, you know, where your daughters will be in the organization? What does that look like? So, Mike, um, good thing my wife is not sitting here. Um, my wife thinks I work too hard already and that I should slow down. And I explained to her that that's not going to happen. Uh, I think that we could be five years from now, triple the size of assets. I think we'll be double the employees. I think we will be substantially more skewed to advisors and not as much support. Um, you know, the industry is, is going through a lot of changes. AI is going to change a lot of how we do things. You know, the amount of technology that's coming, how we approach the business, the support that AI will give you. And I'm not really worried with that as much as I know that ultimately the client's going to be with you because of the relationship with you and the client. And AI will provide you all kinds of great tools, but at the end of the day, it's going to be Larry and the client or Marjana and the client, whoever. Um, Goose has got us built out right now, so from what I'm going to call an infrastructure standpoint, we could take a group in Michigan, a group in South Carolina, and plug them in and internally and with LPL. They could be operational almost immediately. So we've taken the first couple of years of getting it there, and we're there now. And we've actually, uh, February 1st is the first guy going to plug into us. We've got a commitment out of him, and he's plugging in on the first. And then his partners every three or four months are going to uh, join him. Um, I think assets will be substantially higher, and I think advisors will be substantially higher. And I can actually, I have to do that because of ages. If I'm going to keep this company up and running, I need young blood. Mm -hmm. I need, I, I, I can't, I can't work as hard as I'm working here for the next 10 years like this. I really like to work and it's been good, but I need fresh bodies. Yeah. And your wife wants you to retire soon, I'm sure. <laughs> um. She's very tolerant of the whole family dynamics, and it's challenging for her. Um, my compromise with her is um, we travel a lot, and if I got to see a client in California, I'll take her along, and I'll work for a couple of days, and we'll play for a couple of days. If there's a convention in Vegas, we'll go to Vegas for a couple of days in the convention, and we'll stay a few days. and. Play a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, we, wife and I, have a home in Bethesda, which is a DC suburb, 
and um, I work down there a day a week, I'll say. And that's about a two-hour drive from where I am. Uh, but her and I have kind of developed our own friends and situation down there. So it gives us a time to be away from the office, away from the kids, family, office, and, and do our thing. So um, we've been together forever. So uh, I, I don't have 50 years with her, but almost. So uh, actually, counting the 10 years we dated, I do have 50 years with her. Uh, <laughs> but um, I mean, really excited for what the opportunity we have. And the opportunity came because we made the change. Yeah. So let's uh, shifting gears a bit. Are are there any specific investments or sectors that you find particularly exciting or promising in today's market at the moment? And so the, the timing on that's perfect. Um, so thinking about my history, I grew up when interest rates were really really high. You could see a fifteen percent tax free bond. Yeah. And I worked for small bond houses to start with. So my background was fixed income. Well, we went 30 years where interest rates were terribly low. And what did the Federal Reserve just do for us? Over the last two years, raised interest rates five and a half percent. So you had munis going from two and three quarters to over five. You had treasuries going from a quarter to five percent. So over the last year, I have bought tens of millions of treasuries, tens of munis, millions of munis. We've been moving substantial money into the preferred market where you have preferreds that were trading at face value, 100, that because rates went up, went down 20%. Now they're trading at 80 cents on the dollar and paying 7%. I use that as a very opportunistic time because much of my clientele is what? And, and, and Larry, you, you, uh, you froze up there for a second. You said um, they're, they're, they're selling for 100 and you said because rates went down. What happened there? They dropped about 20% in value. So right, the, right. It was trading at 100. It got down to about 80. Right. Today, you've probably seen that move back to 85, 86. Think about the 10-year treasury. The 10-year Treasury six weeks ago was yielding over 5%. Yeah, and it's you down know, to like 4% or th that's where you, I hit yesterday. You hit 399, 398. Yeah. Okay, that's a huge move. There's your opportunity in the fixed income market. If you believe what I said earlier, that the Fed's going to have to bring rates down, then munis, fixed income of any kind, is going to do what? It's going to go up. Um, the opportunity that LPL has given Larry and his team is that a lot of the products that LPL had, Wells never offered to us. We were not uh, in alternative investments, a very minimal menu of products. LPL, there, there's hundreds of them that you can pick and choose from. The menu is almost too full in that it takes so much time to do the due diligence and pick products that you really are comfortable with and you want to recommend to your client. But that's been, an, again, a, a new window for me and an opportunity to show clients that you've had for 30 years totally different ideas. Period. Mm. Thank you. So, so uh, Larry, to get this straight, so uh, I know that, you know, what, 2022 was that first year that um, we actually saw both bonds and stock market go down. I think it was like they said the, uh, you know, fourth time it's ever happened in the, you know, history. Um, and, you know, so in, in what you're saying there is that, you know, the rates, the 10 year treasury was at 0.6 during COVID. It shot up to, you know, what, two and a half, three percent overnight. Uh, a lot of people started buying the treasuries. And then from there, they kept going up to 5%. Is that where people lost a lot of money? Well, it's sure. If you were in there along the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if, if you've been a long term holder of the treasuries, then you got beat up. So. Let me go. Give me, uh, let me give you the same analogy, but let's use tax freeze for a second. So, 
three years ago, you bought a tax-free bond, A-rated, 30-year, uh, pick a state, you were probably at 3%. Two months ago, that bond was at 5%. So consequently, you turn around and see that bond now trading at 80 cents on the dollar. Right. On that bond today now is back at, uh, let's call it 91, 92, 93. That bond is going to go to 100 cents on the dollar. If you think about where we are as a country, we have what? $34 trillion of debt on the books. What percentage of the federal deficit comes due in the next three years? 50%. The federal government has to sell $17 billion of bonds to just cover what's maturing. What's the average cost on that debt? 1.6%. Wow. If they sold it today, it's going to cost them four and a half. The Federal Reserve has no choice because of what I just said than to bring down interest rates over the next year or two. It's an election year. Federal Reserve is supposed to be neutral. It always supports whoever's in office. Okay? We're not going back to a half a percent on Treasury. But you could go back to two and a half, three versus four and a half. Five. Sure. So that dynamic changes interest rates. You're, you're looking at, um, okay, let me give you a prime example. I was on the way to D.C. the other night for meetings, and my phone rang, and I work a lot in the car. And the daughter of a, a good client called and said, Larry, Mom and Dad said, i got to talk to you. Husband and I are thinking about buying a house. And we're going to need a mortgage. And this guy's going to offer me six and a quarter. And I said, well, mortgage rates are more like seven to eight. Six and a quarter sounds good. Well, and he, I said, I take it you're buying a new house and this is a builder. How'd you know? Well, I said, well, he's buying down the, the mortgage for you. That's a good deal. Make sure that you can refinance the mortgage. Make sure there's no clause in there that there's some severe penalty if you refinance, okay? Because in my mind, 18 months from now, mortgages are going to be back at five. They're going to be somewhere significantly or they are today. And she said, no, there's no, then, then you do it. The housing industry is trying to offset, to accommodate these higher interest rates. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Actually, back to kind of, I kind of got around the horn on your question, but the bond market creates a lot of opportunity, I think, for a bit here. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if we wait a year, we wait six months, it's not going to be as good as an opportunity. Um, I think AI that's already had a huge run and a ton of money's been made is going to be the most deflationary issue to hit this country in 100 years. It's going to change the whole dynamics. Yeah. So there's huge opportunity in that tech sector around that computer. And we're just now totally disruptive. Millions of people are going to get displaced working. Not a pretty sight there. But there's an incredible opportunity to bring down inflation and for companies to produce better and more with less. What do you think about uh, Powell saying yesterday that uh, he's looking at possible three rate cuts next year? I think that's at least. I think that's at least. Originally, they were talking about the fourth quarter. Now we're talking about March. Okay. The the, uh, the numbers are dictating. And see, the bond market has already told the Fed what they have to do. Right. Without the Fed doing anything. The 10 year treasury, we just said, went from four to three nine, three nine nine. Uh, that didn't have anything to do with that. That was purely what the bond market said we have to do. Okay, remember so, so the that, that means people were buying bonds, right? They're buying they, bonds. They, 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 the last month they have bought bonds in a big way. 
because yeah. the more buyers come in, you drive up the price, you drive up the price, you bring down the yield. Yeah. Inverse, mm -hmm. inverse squirrel. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the stock market, considering everything this year, has had a really nice year again. I mean, we had an awful year last year with the rising interest rates. You still have 2 million unfilled jobs in the country. The demand for jobs is still there. And companies are figuring out. It's good. Um, that doesn't mean we can't have indigestion. Now, if you look at the geopolitical world, it's awful. I mean, if you look at Israel and Hamas and that conflict, if you look at Ukraine and Russia in that two-year tragedy, um, you've got China, you know, what are they going to do? Um, besides all that, in spite of all that, markets continue to do okay. And there is plenty of cash around to go into the markets. Um, you've had uh, sectors of the market drug industry has not had a particularly good year. Um, if you look at the banks, they've done better in the last month, but they've not had a good year. Um, but for me, I'm looking at diversified portfolios and diversified asset allocations. I'm going to have the, I'm going to have the winners and I'm going to have some of the losers too. But when you put them together, you end up as, as a decent win. Well, I think that's that's kind of like the perfect ending there to wrap up our conversation. Um, any final thoughts uh, before we go here, Larry? No, I tell you, thank you for having me. Um, it's been been fun. Um, I'm excited about uh, the markets. I'm excited about interest rates coming down. Um, I'm excited with the opportunity that my company has. And uh, let's talk in a year and see where we are. Yeah. Well, works Larry, it's been, an absolute, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on our show with us today. And thank you so much for sharing your insights and your expertise in the wealth management industry and with us and our listeners. Um, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank and you to so our listeners, much. thanks for tuning in to another episode. A huge thank you to our guest, Larry. Um, remember to tune in next time. Thanks, everyone.